And okay, I've, I've started the recording. Okay, well, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Kelly Dwyer. I'm with Nature Education Opportunities. And I am delighted that we have so many people that are interested in gardening, gardening for pollinators. I think that's probably a symptom of this long, cold, icy, windy winter that we've had that just won't seem to quit. Um, I know this morning I had ice on the bird bath and I thought, okay, it's into now late April. So I think like me, many of you are anxious to get outside, get your hands in the moist soil, feel that sun on your face, look at the beautiful colors. So I, I think some of you have already expressed to me the appreciation of looking at this slide as we're waiting to get started. So it, it's a, a harbinger of beautiful things to come this spring and summer. Um, so one thing with gardening that I'm a big believer in, it connects us to nature. It's a really simple, easy way right outside your back door or your home space to connect with nature. And many of you are probably familiar with the benefits of connecting with nature in terms of a health, just a mindful, relaxing and calm standpoint. So this is a great way to continue doing that right outside your back door. And gardening for pollinators gives gardening a purpose, which I'm all about that. Many of you are aware of the challenges that are facing pollinators. So part of the conversation we'll have tonight is how do we mitigate that? What role do we play as we become more educated in the challenges and ways to really help these particular magnificent animals that we're inviting into our gardening spaces? What do we do in terms of what we provide for food and our gardening practices that keep them as safe as possible? And our first technical issue, Mary, I am having trouble advancing this slide. Oh, here we go. Okay, so the agenda this evening, I've broken it into four distinct uh, components. First, we're going to talk about who are the insect pollinators, those native pollinators that we're hoping to attract to our gardens. And then we'll chat a little bit about what are some safe gardening practices. Again, I feel um, really compelled to talk about the sense of responsibility that we have if we are gardening for pollinators, inviting them in, it's incumbent upon us to really provide those safe, healthy places for them to come forage for nectar and pollen. And then we'll talk a little bit about what are the native perennials and annuals that offer really the best food source and the healthiest plants, because those healthy plants are the ones that evolved here in our region. So those are the ones that you'll want to buy. They're the most cost-effective, that will really show up year after year for you. And then with that background knowledge, we'll talk about what are some easy planting ideas for all spaces, for patios, balconies, small backyards. Because if you have a space to offer some plants, these pollinators will find you. Okay, so uh, just to kind of frame the appreciation that I have for the pollinators, our famed Harvard educated biologist, E.O. Wilson, who just passed away this past year, um, he wrote a book, many books, but his Forgotten Pollinators, there's a beautiful quote that every third bite of food you take, thank a bee or other pollinator. Really, uh, pollinators are responsible for the health of our agricultural supply, our food supply, as well as our economy to a large degree. So these little winged insects perform quite an amazing feat when you think about how we are all nurturing our, our own health. So it's important, again, as we think about pollinators to show that appreciation by safe practices that we can adopt. All right, just to kind of step back through the lens of pollination, how does pollination happen? Um, some of you are probably already taking your Allegra and various allergy medications because especially with the winds that we've had lately that just won't seem to quit that you can see on this graph that pollination by air or by wind is only about 20% of pollination of trees and shrubs and plants. 4% is by water, so pollen that would fall on water and then pollinate those, probably more of the uh, wetland plants. But 80% of pollination does occur by organisms. And those pollinators can be insects, birds, mammals. If you think about um, when we were kids, those little uh, burdock seeds that look like little brown balls of Velcro and if an animal moved across it would attach to its fur so that's how mammals can help pollinate but tonight we're primarily focused on insects as pollinators. I'll put our little plug in for hummingbirds on a couple of our slides too. So let's kind of 
frame our conversation insect pollinators. Who are we talking about when we say insect pollinators? Butterflies, moths, honeybees, and native bees. So if we think about this comprehensive list, we can take away from our conversation tonight honeybees. We're going to focus on butterflies, moths, and those native bees. Those native bees that really are sort of the unsung heroes of the pollinator world, and you'll meet some of them um, coming right up. So what I mean by native bees, these are bees, mainly solitary bees that actually evolved here in the Northeast or in New Hampshire. So they, so they originated here and they've evolved here, which means they're extremely efficient at what they do. European honeybees are an introduced species and they, again, play a tremendous critical role in pollination of a lot of agricultural crops. But our native bees are the ones that um, are fascinating and that we can actually attract with our gardening um, ideas that we'll talk about tonight. And they're responsible for pollinating approximately one third of the agricultural crop. So they do again play a, a critical role with that. Two, uh, 20,000 species worldwide. If we hone in a little bit more in North America, 4,000 species and 200 right here in New Hampshire. So you can just see the little, little thumbnail pictures. They're really quite bright and vibrant and really interesting looking. Unlike honeybees, which are beautiful, but they um, tend to just come in, in one, one size and one coloration. So I, I think the native bees are really fascinating. Okay, and these native bees, they really are the, um, as E.O. Wilson said, the unsung heroes of the pollination realm. Then if you think about flowers produce pollen to uh, be cross-pollinated with uh, other members of their species so we can have seed production, so pollination is a critical function and what flowers have evolved to do is to offer nectar, which is protein and sugar and highly valued as a nutritional source for all insects. So it's kind of like a little thank you um, package that the flowers will offer in terms of nectar to entice these insects to come and inadvertently get pollen on their bodies as they forage and fly to other different uh, plants. So it's kind of an ingenious strategy. Okay, so let's meet the little sweat bees. These are small, mainly sol solitary bees, and they live in the soil. So they're named sweat bees because what they do is they seek salt on human skin because like all of these insects that we'll talk about, they need a various um, diet of different minerals and nutrients. So if they can't find those particular nutrients like salt in the soil, they will actually be enticed to come to us sweaty gardeners that are out there. So don't be alarmed if you're out pruning your gardens or planting things. If you see these little beautiful metallic green uh, bees, they're harmless. Like most insects or most bees, they have to be quite agitated and threatened before they will use any of their defense mechanisms. They're just more interested in survival and foraging for food. So um, I encourage the first thing to do is to not swat if any of these types of insects fly toward you. They're more curious, they're not out to harm. And in New Hampshire, we have 70 species of the sweat bees. So uh, quite a large selection. Leaf cutter bees, I find these really fascinating and I love to look at leaves to see if there's that little round disc cut. So what they do is they will cut the disc of leaf matter and they lay their eggs in hollow stems or dead little branches. So they'll kind of seal it off with a, almost like a manhole cover cut from a leaf. So it's really ingenious. So you could even start in the next couple of weeks if you want to be out looking around your yard to see if there are any leaves that have this circular disc cut. Um, it tends to be a little bit more of a, um, an activity for them as we get into June and even July when things hopefully will warm up at some point. So these bees are very efficient pollinators because not only do they have those little bristly hairs for collecting pollen on their legs, but they have them on their underside of their body too. So when they land on the flower, they collect that pollen and then just very efficiently bring it to other flowers. And mason bees, um, most of you probably have seen sort of the bee hotels or these, these little uh, twig-like structures that you can buy at garden centers or even some of the little boutique shops. They're primarily put out for mason bees and mason bees will lay an egg in these hollow stems seal it off with mud, and then those larvae will either overwinter or over the summer and emerge in the fall, depending on the species. And there are 30 of them here in New Hampshire. 
And the beautiful thing about mason bees is they are what we call um, a generalist. So they don't really have any particular floral preferences. So they're just attracted to all flowers that offer pollen. So very efficient pollinator in that respect. So they're kind of, um, I look at them as, as like the omnivores of the not the picky eaters. They would go to the buffet and want to load their plate with pretty much anything that they can find. So not picky at all. Carpenter bees um, look a lot like a bumblebee because of the, the shape and the coloration. But one way to tell the difference from a carpenter bee as opposed to a bumblebee is carpenter bees have a shiny abdomen, that sort of long black section um, that is opposite their head. So look for that shiny section there of the uh, abdomen and that would be a carpenter bee. They're attracted to dead wood so they would excavate what looks like almost a perfectly drilled round hole and lay their eggs in that. Carpenter bees are also a generalist pollinator so attracted to many different flowers. They are a huge pollinator of squash, melon and raspberry. So if you have a pretty good garden you'll definitely want to be attracting the carpenter bees by providing some other type of habitat like dead wood for them to actually excavate and lay their eggs in. Okay, and then we have um, my personal favorite, the bumblebees. And in New Hampshire, we have 10 species of bumblebees. They are our only native bee that is what we call a colony nester. The other ones that I just showed you are solitary, but bumblebees, uh, their colonies range anywhere from 50 to 150 individuals. The queens are the only ones that survive over the winter. She's fertilized in the fall and she will ha um, go into her hibernacular or underground burrow. They are just starting to emerge now. So I was, um, I was thinking of that E.O. Wilson quilt uh, this, this afternoon as I was having an apple and some peanut butter outside. And I heard that like low zzz, the bumblebee. She was going to some dandelion that I was sitting nearby and, and the only sunny windless patch I could find in my yard this afternoon. So I was grateful to be able to thank her for a role that she's going to perform this summer in my garden. Um, and they are really um, predominant pollinators of blueberries, cranberries, eggplant, and tomatoes. So if you are putting those things in your garden, welcome the bumblebees. Okay, so that's kind of a little thumbnail sketch on our native bees. Let's move into the butterfly realm here. So we have over on the top left slide, there's the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. You should be starting to see them within the next month. They are one of our early emerging butterflies. And then moving over that beautiful black butterfly with the blue tones on its wings on the, blue, on the sunflower is a spice bush swallowtail. I have a spice bush um, shrub. It's actually more of a tree right outside my house. And, it's the type of plant that it's native. And if you rub the leaves together, you can smell that real pungent spice. And that's a host plant for this caterpillar. So I'm never alarmed when I see, you know, different holes in the leaves. I know that most likely there's a spice bush swallowtail um, egg that is now starting to pupate into the caterpillar. So I don't mind finding little nibbles in my leaves. In fact, I would encourage all of you, if you're seeing little, um, things that are eating your leaves of your plants or your shrubs or your trees, really identify what you think it is before you take any action. And we'll get into a whole process a little bit further on in our program. And then we have a little cabbage white butterfly. These are the ones that you'll see flitting over meadows and fields throughout the summer. And of course, the middle one is the iconic monarch butterfly, which many of us are really so happy to be welcoming. Um, the first monarch in my yard last year was July 9th. So I feel like I'm almost setting my watch by that. Like I can't wait for that early part of July when the monarchs that uh, third, second and third generation arrive up here in the Northeast and then start to continue that final cycle into the fourth generation, which those are the, the, um, the super generation, the migrating ones down to Mexico. So they're on their way now. They're probably, um, they've left Mexico, the ones that overwintered and they're in the midst of that first or second cycle of um, laying eggs and then coming to the adult caterpillars and into the butterflies. And then of course we have a beautiful painted lady, another gorgeous native um, butterfly here. Moths, moths of um, insects that we don't often think about as pollinators, but they perform an amazing function primarily at night. So they have different adaptations than butterflies. This one right here that's uh, right 
kind of that snazzy looking one is a hawk moth and those will be flying around flowers at night, um, just gorgeous coloration on a lot of our moths. The one over to the right of it on that green leaf is an Isabella moth. Isabella moth is the woolly bear caterpillar's adult form. So you, you, you think about those little woolly bears that we see in the fall that look like mini little, um, you know, I call them little teddy bears because I just love the coloration of them. They will pupate um, over the winter and then form into this Isabella moth. The one on the bottom left is a Cecropia moth. It's one of the silk moths, um, huge, huge moths. That's it's about the size of the palm of my hand. So gorgeous moth that um, uses oak leaves and some other of our trees for its host plant. I particularly love this one. Uh, it's the rosy maple moth, the one in the lower right. It's just beautiful. I've seen those on my porch. It's attracted to the porch light. So it's kind of fun to go out looking for moths at night. It's another excuse of mine to be outside with a flashlight at night. But look at that beautiful pink and the yellow. Um, moths and butterflies are slightly different in terms of the way they hold their wings. Moths will hold their wings more on a horizontal plane where butterflies like to bring their wings almost into a V shape. So that's one way to kind of tell the difference if um, some of the moths are, can be active at, in the daytime as well. The other thing is moths tend to be thicker and stout and fuzzy. So collecting pollen in a slightly different way than butterflies. And the plants that we'll be talking about a little bit are all very attractive um, for butterflies and moths that we just talked about. And there's many other native butterflies and moths. So I would encourage you to look online. There's lots of resources. New Hampshire Fish and Game has a great section on native insects too. Um, I'll mention right now, New Hampshire, uh, let's see, it's the UNHB lab has done phenomenal work on native pollinators. So they've got some great resources to look online at the UNHB lab. They have um, lots of resources in terms of planting and, and how to do this so that you're increasing the health of our pollinators. In addition to what I will be presenting tonight, but this is only an hour, so I'm only really scratching the surface of all of the information that's available out there. Okay, so we've kind of talked about who to expect into um, your garden. Who do you want to bring in from a native standpoint? Again, I'll talk a lot about native pollinators, native plants, because it's really important that we're encouraging the health of those species that have evolved here, because those are the ones that um, really produce the best outcome for our pollination overall in terms of our plants and, and as well as our um, agriculture. So thinking about pollinators, and let's, let's discuss and sort of get a frame around some of the challenges that they're facing right now. Um, it, a lot of this has been in the news in the last couple of years, which is a good thing because it's bringing again education and awareness so we can make informed decisions about what we do as consumers and gardeners. Habitat loss, of course, is, is a, a huge challenge for pretty much any form of wildlife as we start to encroach further into um, meadows and woods. So as you know, we, we have to kind of strike that fine line between um, providing homes and, and communities for ourselves, but there's lots of ways to do it smart by preserving green spaces as um, developers are putting in new developments. And that seems to be a really good trend here in the state, which preserves as much habitat for a lot of wildlife as it as can be. So um, habitat loss is something that, again, can be mitigated with, with smart construction. Climate change is something that is, is affecting pollinators in this way. If you think about, like we were talking, several of us prior to we started, that we've had a lot of wind, we've had a lot of cold, we've had a lot of rain. So insects being um, ecto ectotherms, they're not able to make their own body heat. They rely on the warm air and the warm sun to warm those muscles, which would then fuel their wings to fly. So um, if we have a lot of cold, wet, rainy weather, they're not able to fly and forage and um, you know, perpetuate their species through mating or um, hibernating or whatever function they need to survive. So that can impact their numbers adversely. It can also uh, affect the bloom time of certain native species that have evolved here that are used to uh, the sunlight sort of spurring on particular blooms. And if they're blooming, their pollen and nectar is being offered, 
but the pollinators aren't able to fly to forage, the timing can be all off and that can have an adverse effect in terms of climate change on our pollinators. Invasive species, um, several, of, uh, several of you may be familiar with things like bittersweet, things that didn't necessarily evolve here in the Northeast that really can present a challenge to our native plants. So, um, and then native uh, insects can be threatened by invasive insects that can take over the foraging of a lot of the plants that um, are available. So that can be a challenge. And I think probably one of the biggest challenges that has come up in the last 20 years are pesticides. Um, and I'm gonna segue into this next slide. They are, and several of you may be familiar with this term, neonicotinoids or neonics for short. This is a new class of pesticides that has been around for about 20 years. And many um, countries in Europe are banning the use of them because studies after study are showing that they have really unintended consequences on the nerve impulses of these beneficial pollinators like we were just talking about, all these native bees. And it targets the, um, the communication systems in these invertebrates. And of course, invertebrates are those animals that do not have a backbone. So they're really the essence of the food web. When you think about all the thousands of insects and um, little microscopic animals that live in our soil that sort of keep the whole works of a food web going. So neonics are um, applied several different ways. They could be seeds that are coated with a neonic chemical. So once that seed germinates, the plant as it's growing absorbs that chemical and it presents itself in all aspects of the plant, not only the leaves, which initially is what it was intended to target. So let's say there was a, um, a pest that was affecting um, a soybean crop or a large monoculture that, that that would be something that the particular insect targeted would eat and then it would, would lose its nerve impulses and eventually die. But unfortunately, there's sort of the collateral damage in a lot of these foraging of pollinators um, that we've talked about. And neonics can linger in the soil for months or even years. So, um, and it, it's kind of, it's become a huge problem. A lot of research is being done on it and scientists are finding that these chemicals are actually affecting water supplies. And there's also some preliminary research that's suggesting that it's also having some effects on mammals. And of course, we're a member of, of the, the mammal community. So, um, people will say, well, then what do we do about it? So again, just this little graphic here, I think this is kind of a good visual as far as how ubiquitous these are in our environment. We might spray something on our plants and then inadvertently the insects that are collecting the pollen or the nectar could be transporting that back to a hive or back to um, other insects and that can present a catastrophic effect it leaches into the soil and into the aquifer or water sources. And like I mentioned, they tend to have a long half-life. They are not something that really disappears pretty quickly. So the, the toxicity is, is pretty um, dramatic as it continues to accumulate in our soil and our water supplies. Um, so then um, some of you might be thinking, well, what, what do we do then about those pesky insects that could make our gardens um, not so healthy? Well, I would, definitely um, propose a solution in a moment, but um, just in terms of your purchasing power, because there's a lot of consumer advocacy to sort of eliminate or mitigate what we're doing with the neonics. They have, um, there's many chemicals that these particular class of pesticides go by, I can't even pronounce half of them, but what I would encourage you to do, again, something like the UNHB lab, some of the resources out there that are reputable, the Xerxes Society have a comprehensive list of what these products are so that when you're going to purchase anything in a, um, a garden center or a big box store, you can bring that list with you. And as an educated consumer, you can make sure that you're not purchasing any type of sprays or chemicals that contain um, these products because um, it, it does have very drastic consequences for our pollinators. Um, so again, being educated and being aware is a really good place to be because then you can take action that can make a difference. Um, so what I like to do is instead of spraying, I like to use what we call an integrated pest management strategy or IPM. 
And what this is, is it really gives us um, permission to spend time in our garden so that we're actually getting outside and getting to know our plants. We're looking at things, we're inspecting things. One of my favorite things in the morning is to get my cup of coffee and as the sun is sort of really getting warm to go out and look at my plants, sort of look under the leaves. That really gets me in touch with what I planted as, as a caretaker and as someone who's stewarding this particular um, plant or garden area. So IPM, the idea is that we accept that there will be a certain threshold of damage from um, nibbling or biting or chewing, which again could very well be the larva or the caterpillars of those gorgeous butterflies or moths that we're looking to attract. Um, I remember years ago, I had a couple of dill plants and I was wondering what is eating them? And I saw this caterpillar, I'd never really, I didn't know what it was. I looked it up in a field guide and I realized it was the black tiger swallowtail was eating the dill. So it had a whole new frame when I realized that I was providing a host plant for this gorgeous butterfly. So it's important to know what you're looking at, what pest, or it may not be a pest, it may be a beneficial insect, but to accept that there is going to be a certain amount of eating because you're providing food for these animals. And then um, one way, once you identify, if you realize that it's becoming a problem, identify what it is, and then you can manually um, remove a, a lot of these pests. For example, I have a, an awful problem with um, the Japanese beetles. So what I do is I get a can of water, a little bit of dish soap on top, and then I just go around and I just sort of manually um, move them off any of my plants rather than spray and inadvertently harm something else that's on that plant or that garden area. So it's, it's an ongoing process of sort of, of inspecting, um, identifying and removing if needed. Blast a cold water from the hose often takes care of a lot of problems. And one thing that you can do as well is bring in beneficial insects. You can, um, for example, order the egg casings of the praying mantis, which is that uh, insect right above the, the words beneficial insect kind of it's an amazing thing to see in the gardens with those praying hands and it's an extremely efficient um, predator of a lot of undesirable insects in our gardens. As soon as my milkweed blooms in the summertime, I have all these aphids that come, but inevitably there's lady, lady birds or lady um, beetles that come too. So they will take care of those aphids as will the lacewing. So if you look at that insect down the lower left, you would think, that doesn't look like it really belongs there or it's not a butterfly or moth, but lacewings are a huge consumer of um, a lot of larvae of, of uh, pesky insects that would really do some damage to our um, plants. So again, I would encourage you to sort of rethink our strategy of pest management. It necess not necessarily is something that's dangerous to the plant, but identify what it is and see if there's a way to sort of do something that's safer to sort of eliminate or mitigate. Um, okay, so now that we have talked about what type of insects we want to attract, what the challenges uh, that they're facing are and how we can play a role to sort of um, benefit them and not do some unintended damage by some of the things that we may have been doing before, before we realized what was happening. It's important to talk about what type of plants we can offer and kind of see that I'm scaffolding this so that we're sort of doing this in a, a way that gives us some, some knowledge, some decision making before we go out and just willy nilly buy a bunch of plants at a garden center and then feel overwhelmed and been there, done that. So I'm trying to avoid that for some of you who are new to gardening. Okay, so I have here, um, we call the perennial all-stars. Now perennials are those plants that are designed to come back year after year. So the first year that you plant them, whether it's in a garden or a window box or a planter, and we'll talk about different types of gardening, that um, if they've given the, given, given the proper care initially, they should come back year after year for you, which is kind of exciting. So it's a great investment. Um, so let's talk about that first one in the upper left. This is goldenrod and goldenrod comes in a variety of different shapes and sizes. So this particular goldenrod is great for a meadow setting. It's really tall. 
Um, it's a late season bloomer, which means you will see it bloom around the end of summer, beginning of fall. Now, a lot of people, I've done lots of uh, walks over the years and people immediately will point to it and it gets blamed for uh, the late season allergies that many of us suffer from, you know, as fall is arriving. Well, goldenrod, unfortunately, is sort of victimized and yanked out because people think it's what they're allergic to, but it's not. It's ragweed. And ragweed is oftentimes growing next to goldenrod in the same habitat. And it's a little sort of lime green, very inconspicuous looking plant. So, um, so the next time you see goldenrod, thank it because it's a great food source for those migrating monarchs, as well as those bumblebees that are getting ready to hibernate. So goldenrod is a gorgeous one that's native. Um, over here to the right is columbine. I have a bunch that's starting to grow up in my garden. It's an early season native plant, which is the beneficial uh, for those insects like the Eastern tiger swallowtail, that beautiful yellow butterfly that will be showing up fairly soon, as well as the hummingbird. So um, when columbine blooms, it's one of the first thing that the butterflies and then the hummingbird will go to because it's a specialty plant which requires a butterfly's proboscis um, to really get in there to drink that nectar. So just really pretty sort of fringy ethereal plants. Um, down in the lower left, we have um, Echinacea or coneflower. This is an extremely wonderful plant to have because sturdy stalks, it can be planted in planters and it tends to stay compact. Um, you can see that looks like gumdrops, the seed heads, and there's so, there's hundreds and hundreds of little crevices for pollen and nectar on that firm seed head that uh, I've watched many bumblebees and, and mason bees and all the native bees literally stumbling over each other to try to get to the different sources of nectar. And so very efficient way for pollination to happen. But the other nice thing about the echinacea is that once that seed head forms, and um, the plant um, will kind of die for the winter time. It remains on the stalks, those seed heads, and goldfinch love it. So I leave it in my garden. I have some in, in planters, so little pots of it, but the goldfinch are very attracted to those seed heads over the course of the winter. And it adds kind of some interesting winter elements too, rather than just that blank landscape of snow cover, you can have some of the echinacea seed heads popping through with the goldfinch on it. So that's kind of a a fun little thing to, for, that makes drab winter a little more exciting. And down here to the lower right, we have yarrow. Now yarrow is a plant that doesn't mind um, drought conditions. So if you have a place in your yard or planters that tend to get very dry, yarrow is a great option for you. It's little tiny um, colorful flowers. They come in several different colors with fringy foliage, very pretty. And again, a great uh, source of nectar and pollen for those pollinators that we're looking to entice. Okay, um, I'm gonna give a shout out. These are my perennial favorites that are must haves. The upper left one are wild asters and we're fortunate here in the Northeast to have a lot of different species of native wild asters come in gorgeous colors. A lot of them are um, sort of blues and purples. I have some really pretty, almost like a red raspberry color that comes back year after year. They tend to be uh, plants that bloom later in the season like the goldenrod. So you will find them in almost into September, October. So again, very attractive for those migrating monarchs, those late season, even uh, bumblebees and honeybees that are looking to collect that last little bit of nectar and pollen. Um, the middle frame, you can, for some of you with um, good detective eyes, you'll notice that there's a monarch sitting atop the flower head there. This is swamp milkweed. And um, I'm gonna chat about uh, milkweed in, in another frame, but if you are looking to attract monarchs to your garden, then it's a must. You must have some type of milkweed because it is the only host plant for the, um, the monarch butterfly. So swamp milkweed tends to be a little bit better behaved than the common milkweed, which is great for gardens that have a bigger expanse or a meadow. So swamp milkweed tends to be, again, more compact, a little bit um, stays where you plant it, but the fragrant flowers are still spectacular. The leaves tend to be a little thinner and narrower than the common milkweed. And this does really well in a planter or um, a garden box. 
So you can certainly work with it if you have a balcony or patio, and we're gonna talk about some of those planting options in a moment. Over to the right are little Johnny jump ups. These are like mini little pansies. They come up very early in the season. So a great source of food for those uh, early emerging bumblebees. And just like the, um, the clover and the dandelions are really beneficial for those early pollinators that are looking for some food. Down on the lower left, I have um, Monada or bee balm. And this is really a wonderful plant to attract butterflies because again, that tubular structure of the flower is great for the butterflies proboscis, that sort of tongue-like appendage, which is like a hollow straw that coils up in its mouth parts. And uh, hummingbirds also love monotters, so you can kind of um, attract your hummingbirds too because they, they see the red and they know it's a source of, of good nectar for them. Um, I think I did mention that nectar is uh, filled with protein and sugar, which is really desirable food source for energy and growth. So um, then any of those plants that offer good sources of nectar, which are the ones we just talked about, are really things that you want to think about planting. Okay, so let's kind of back up here and talk about the common milkweed. Um, as I mentioned, the swamp milkweed, which is sort of a well-behaved version of this, is um, also a, a host plant for the monarch butterfly. Um, for any of you who have sort of broken a leaf open of milkweed, you'll notice that sort of milky, sticky white substance that is actually filled with um, a chemical. It's like a cardiac glycoside. So basically what it does is it can poison um, any type of animal that would eat whatever consumes it. So for example, this monarch butterfly would have laid her eggs underneath the leaves of the milkweed. And once those eggs hatch out and the caterpillar starts to feed, that caterpillar has a certain level of protection from predation by the mere fact it's ingesting those cardiac glycosides. And animals have evolved to recognize the danger of this black and orange coloration. There was a researcher who was watching a blue jay who actually consumed the body part of an adult butterfly and this blue jay did a, a bird version of vomit about 30 times over a several minutes. So it can be toxic. So animals have quickly learned that the, the red, the orange, and the black coloration of the adult monarch means danger, stay away. So it's kind of a brilliant adaptation by using the milkweed to get that, those cardiac glycosides within um, the body structure. But I, I just love, again, you can see that there's the, the chrysalis of the pupa of the monarch butterfly in that upper left frame. Beautiful, beautiful um, chrysalis with the little, it looks like someone bedazzled it. It's really quite brilliant. Okay, so I encourage you, if you do have some garden space to have milkweed, just run wild. It's easy enough to pull out if, um, if you feel like it's getting a little too out of control. Just um, make sure you're washing your hands after you do that because you will get the the, um, the sappy uh, substance on your hands. All right, so annuals. Now annuals are a little bit different from perennials in the sense that they don't come back year after year, especially here in our climate where you know it gets, it gets pretty cold in the winter time. So, but there are some options. Sunflowers are a beautiful uh, flower to grow or plant for a lot of our butterflies and bees. Just again, bear in mind, if you're starting them from seeds, make sure you're doing your due diligence that your seed packets either are organic or they specify neonic free. Because as I mentioned, a lot of seed producers are treating their seeds with neonicotinoids or the neonic pesticides. So that would be um, going through the plant as it's germinating and growing. So you might inadvertently be introducing those chemicals into your garden space. So again, it's all about education. And like I mentioned, there's lots of research and resources online about neonics. So um, I just mentioned them briefly tonight, but um, it's definitely worth taking a look around at some of those reputable sources like, like UNHB Lab and Xerxes Society to get some real good information on that. The next uh, group of flowers are zinnias. These are, again, beautiful flowers for the garden or planters because they have very firm stalks and the flower heads are pretty firm as well and butterflies can't resist them. And they tend to be flowers that bloom more into later in the summer. So you get that burst of color when a lot of other plants have kind of spent and tired at that point into late July into August. 
Um, I love zinnias. I love the different colors. And then I did do a shout out here down below for herbs. Like I mentioned, um, I've had different butterfly uh, caterpillars on my dill and fennel and different herbs that I've planted. So even though they're not necessarily native, it's fun to be planting herbs um, for our own consumption, as well as to provide host plants for a lot of these, uh, particularly butterflies, some moths too. Okay, so now that we've talked about um, the flowers that we could plant, I just wanna do a quick little um, sort of PSA on what you can do for your lawn. Because if you think about lawn, um, even though it can be beautiful and lush and green, it really doesn't offer any habitat value. So um, what my husband and I are trying to do is we are trying to every year get rid of some of our lawn by planting different perennial beds. So we try to not to sort of bite off more than we can chew, but maybe do a 10 by 10 section. So it's manageable. And that's one thing I would encourage people if you are going to start uh, putting in gardens to make sure you're um, doing it small scale so it's not overwhelming because it can become overwhelming quickly. Um, but to create meadow edges, that's one way to start to like just not mow the whole thing, but watch to see what comes in. There might be some native wildflower flowers that the seeds have been dormant that you can suddenly find that there's a, a beneficial offering for our pollinators. I. Um, I tend to look at weeds differently than maybe a lot of my neighbors might look at them. Weed is certainly something in the eye of the beholder. I love to see the clover come up in the dandelions. It's a little bit of color. Um, I certainly do not have a perfect lawn by any means and that's, I, I'm glad for that, but I love to see the bumblebees on the clover and I love to see different little mason bees on my dandelion. So I'm always happy to see them. So if you could, it's just a matter of reframing how we look at this particular element of our yard space. Okay, so again, now that we um, have talked about who we want to attract and the responsible way to attract them and, and manage our gardens, as well as some of the native perennials and ways that we can offer maximum food for these animals, let's think about, okay, so now where do we offer it? So what are some ways that we can garden to meet all of our different home needs? Okay, so balcony gardenings. Um, many of us may live in uh, situations where we have a balcony available. And the beautiful thing about pollinators, of course, being winged, if we put things out that are attractive to them, they can fly and find us because they are incredible, effective uh, foragers. So they're always looking for different sources of food when they forage. So um, I actually just treated myself, I bought this example of the lower left, you see the sort of wooden garden cart here. I love this planter because it's um, about three and a half feet long by about two and a half feet wide and it's 10 inches deep. So, and it's on wheels. So I can roll it if the sun is changing or if I wanna move it around, I can actually wheel it about. So to me, it's a great option. Um, if you're just starting out, or if you have a balcony or a smaller space, this is very manageable. My mother-in-law had this one last year and she has a deck and we put 14 perennials, daisies. We had all kinds of um, echinaceas and bee bombs within this. It was just filled with color, native plants that were loaded with butterflies and native bees throughout the whole growing season. And the beauty of it is that she could sort of wheel it closer. You know, it, it was portable. So to me, it's a, it's a great option if you're just starting to get something like this that um, you could put out on a balcony or even a patio so it's manageable. Another option to sort of use your uh, balcony space is large planters that do really well with many of the perennials we talked about or even some of the annuals. So you can stagger the heights, you can get this riot of color throughout the bloom season just by using big pots. And um, a lot of them you can get that look like they're terracotta or clay and they're plastic, they're inexpensive, but they have sort of that old world just really charming appearance, or you can get ones that are colorful, so they're really whimsical. So lots of options to garden right on a balcony space. Um, that shouldn't really prevent you from offering wonderful food for these pollinators. All right, patio gardening. Um, we have a patio and what I liked, what I've done with my space is because I like to feel like I'm creating a room within that patio. So it's not just this brick space that I put in that just kind of goes in infinity. I like to wall it off with um, 
different types of planters. So it's nice to have raised planters because not only are you getting instant elevation and height, but you can actually then, I'm not sure what's happening with that yellow. That is quite interesting. It's like those maybe we're tracking some type of pollinator that's flying, but um, the raised uh, beds are great ergonomically. So you're not getting down on your knees or you know really putting pressure on your back. So it's instant height, instant sort of wall-like look. And it's um, a, great, a great back knee friendly type of gardening pra practice. I love this slide here that's on the right because it has the raised um, bed, but it also has that lattice work on the back. So it gives some privacy, a sense of a wall, and it also would support any type of plants that tend to be more vining. So it's a, it's a lot of benefits to those type of patio offerings. And again, any of the um, perennials or annuals that we've talked about will do really well in these type of situations. You can get small perennials that will pretty much stay smaller depending on this um, type of um, container that you put it in. Window boxes, uh, another great way to offer um, little perennials or annuals for our pollinators and just to really dress up um, a deck rail too. It's, there's nothing like a riot of color on top of a white or a, a rustic fence rail. So, and again, there's just so many options. You can sort of let your fingers do the browsing online and you'll find just anything that you're looking for in terms of style or design. Okay, raised beds. Um, this wall one right here on the left, I think is really fascinating because these little planters um, would accommodate any of our herbs, small annuals or small perennials. So you could have many uh, different types of plants, the color, the variety, the texture, all within that type of structure. In the middle one here, you can see that this would be great um, if you do have some type of back issue or um, knee. I just had my, I had knee surgery about six weeks ago for a torn meniscus. So I'm regretting that I don't have more of these planters as you know, everything needs to, needs attention right now. It's a matter of trying to get down there and not ruin what I surgically had repaired. So I wish I had done more raised planters. So I would encourage you if you're just starting out to think this route. Okay, so raised beds, again, could work on patios. They could work in outside spaces on if you're converting a lawn to a garden area. Okay, so speaking of converting lawn to um, a garden space, there are just millions of plans online. So um, you can think about what your sun requirements are. Most of the plants we talked about that are beneficial to pollinators and attractive to them require at least part sun, oftentimes full sun. So if you are total shade, you could still um, do some perennials to attract pollinators, but most pollinators will be attracted to a sunny garden area. So that's something to really consider before you start planning and planting. But again, online, you can find many different garden plans for a, say a 10 by eight or a 10 by 10 space to convert lawn or add a garden space. And the beautiful thing about these plans is if you get them from sources like again, a UNH or ones that are promoting native pollinator plants, is they will give you the design and you'll know exactly what to go to the garden store to buy. So it's, it's not as overwhelming to get plans like this online. I would highly encourage it. And you could use um, a fence. I, I love this look here when you've, you have some, looks like some ladies mantles and some salvia right in front of the fence with roses. So it can really provide that structure, that hardscape within your garden design. Or the lower one, a raised planter, creating by um, putting some flagstone or some type of fieldstone together and then backfilling it with soil. That gives you that really um, sort of more rustic looking planter in that form. Um, in this one right here, where it has just a meandering path, this is wonderful to be able to you know, walk with your coffee or an adult beverage in the afternoon and really be immersing yourself in the different types of plants that are coming throughout the growing season. And that's the beautiful thing about those garden design plans that you can get online is they will have different plants that will bloom early and then midsummer, late summer, and then even into early fall. So there's offering of color and food for pollinators throughout the entire growing season here in New Hampshire. So 
you don't want something that, you know, everything blooms within three weeks and then it's all spent. You want to have a continuous offering. So those plans have factored all that in for you. So um, I would definitely take advantage of Google and be looking for things like that if you're wanting to convert some yard space into a garden. Um, so now that we've talked to about what um, is out there in terms of patio and, and balconies and um, creating more garden spaces, it's important to think about water features because water will attract all of these particular insects that we discussed to your garden, as well as birds and maybe some other um, wildlife that might enhance the whole ecosystem effect. So something like a simple little bird bath that you can just rinse out. So we're kind of, we're keeping track of the mosquitoes, you don't want standing water, but things that could be just cleaned out, rinsed out with a hose and then refilled on a daily basis or circulating little um, fountains like the other two slides would uh, certainly be um, keeping things clean. But I just wanna mention this lower left one here is what we call a butterfly puddle. So if you've ever noticed after rain that butterflies and once the sun comes out, they'll tend to um, sort of conjugate around a puddle in a dirt road, for example. What they're doing is they're finding those minerals in the soil. So you can actually mimic this and create it in your garden. So I have just a terracotta 12 inch um, planter or saucer rather, it's glazed so the water stays in it. Put some rocks, put some sand, and then you can add either compost or manure or rock salt. So the minerals that the butterflies are seeking will actually sort of percolate up through that almost like a muddy sand. You don't want it um, you know, filled with water. You want more of that like sort of mud just wet soil and that is just a huge draw for butterflies as they puddle. And there's lots of ways you can find the DIY things, just Google on YouTube butterfly puddle garden and, and there'll be lots of different instructions. So it's very simple to create this. Um, also in terms of habitat, one thing that's important, we talked about food in offering um, the plants that offer that pollen and nectar water in terms of some type of butterfly puddle or water little feature, and then shelter. So food, water, and shelter are the essential elements that all living things need. So these insects that we're trying to attract also need shelter consideration, not only for um, overwintering forms, but egg laying that oftentimes will overwinter. So um, rock gardens are a great way to entice a lot of these insects or pollinators into your yard. You can have a little rock garden with succulents, or you can even have a pretty little rock pile. And um, again, referencing the bee hotels, I know that's on my weekend list to, to look up some plans so that I can create more bee hotels. This one would be designed primarily for the mason bees, those bamboo sticks that are hollowed out. And again, those are the ones that would fill with egg and then put mud on the, um, to kind of seal that little larva in. So there's lots of those designs and they add sort of a pretty attractive element too to the garden. Um, I would do a big shout out for compost piles as well as brush piles uh, for attracting a numerous assortment of insects that overwinter within the brush pile because they need, again, that sort of, um, oftentimes it's the, the branches in there that are dead that can be hollowed out to support the lava or the overwintering adult. So brush piles are a great addition to your garden space. I think if you have a patio or a balcony, it may be a little bit more difficult to do that. You certainly could, but it, it might um, be a little bit unmanageable. So I would encourage you then to do more of the bee hotel model as far as providing shelter and habitat. All right, so I'll sort of end on this note. When I think about gardening, I like to think of joyful gardening. And there's... Um, sort of a way to frame that and like I've mentioned a few times to do gardening with a purpose so that you know you're providing beneficial habitat for these incredible pollinators these insects that really need our help at this point so that's a feel-good way to be connecting with nature is through um, pollinating gardening for pollinators in a joyful way and also um like I said, if you're new to gardening, start slowly, have it so that it's, it's manageable because these living plants require a certain amount of maintenance, especially the first year. So you're better off starting slow 
and feeling like, wow, I wish I did more than starting big and feel overwhelmed. And I can attest to that feeling because it's, it can be exhausting come July when things really need to be watered constantly. So you're better off starting slow and having it be joyful. Um, one, a couple of things that you can do to really be enjoying your garden is to get out there on a daily basis and engage all of your senses. So have that time where you go out with your coffee or tea or just a glass of water, just kind of connect to your gardens and connect to nature in that way by standing out there, maybe closing your eyes and taking a deep breath in. What do you smell? If you're near milkweed, when that flowers, it's unmistakable how beautiful and, and intoxicating almost that can be. And what do you hear? Do you hear the buzzing of the insects? Because that's almost like, to me, it's nature's music and it's just incredibly relaxing to hear that, knowing you're providing that habitat for those incredible insects. And then touch, I'm, I'm a very tactile person. So I love to go around and feel the leaves. Is it a stiff sort of smooth leaf? Is it more of a fuzzy uh, leaf like um, some of the other the plants like the uh, yarrows, that sort of wispy leaf? What are the textures of the um, flowers feel like? And of course, sight by just standing and mindfully looking around at all of the different colors and the different shapes of the flower petals and the leaves really brings a lot of joy and can promote that instant calm, instant connection with nature uh, while you're providing this incredible habitat for these pollinators. Um, and my favorite way to engage my sense is my sense of taste. I love to have al fresco dining. I love to, um, I grow tomatoes and basil and get some mozzarella and just to sit out there and, and have that as I sit in the garden and just enjoy all the colors and the sounds. Um, and just maybe throw some fresh herbs on, on a salad. Uh, also to be mindful and present. And, and by engaging your senses, you're automatically doing that. So um, I tend to, when I first started gardening, I was so overwhelmed with how much I did, how much I put in, that it wasn't fun. And I felt like I was not mindful. I was mindless. It was just, you know, going around with the hose and the watering can. And I really thought, what have I done? Why did I do this? So that's why I'm, I'm sharing those lessons so that you can learn from sort of my, um, I won't call it mistakes, but, but my sort of progress to where I am now as a gardener and trying to be mindful. And then also to be artistic. There's lots of ways to express your creative side through adding uh, whimsical things to your garden, elements of whether you have little um, stepping stones or statues or little favorite rocks. There's lots of ways to add what we call hardscape, not the the live plants themselves, but other ways to accent that. So um, that's kind of fun to be looking for those pieces too. And then uh, finally, to be an advocate, so a little tongue in cheek play on your role to gently educate, not only maybe your neighbors, but um, people that follow you on Facebook or Instagram, because um, it's all about education. As an educator, this is my passion and my mission to impart the knowledge and maybe the awareness that I've accumulated to share it so that collectively we can really make a difference with what we do in terms of, um, in this instance, our pollinators and promoting pollinator health, as well as enjoyment and health for ourselves being outside. So I thank you so much for joining me tonight. I know I've thrown a lot at you. There's a lot to cover in this topic. Like I said, there's some great resources online from reputable places that will really get you in good shape to go out and start gardening or continue gardening if you've already been sort of on this journey. But I encourage you just to um, enjoy the time that we hopefully have coming up that will warm and, and be conducive for these type of activities. So thank you again, everyone, and have a wonderful weekend coming up. Thank you very much, Kelly. Um, I we have some great uh, comments and everybody is, is saying thank you to you. And um, Ashley did put a note in the um, chat that um, there were some quite people had questions, but that they would get back to them. So I'm sure Ashley will be in touch with you. Okay, wonderful. Yes, that would be great. I know there's a lot of information, so I'm happy to somehow uh, respond to those questions. That's great. And we will have the recording posted on our website, which is aarp.org slash New Hampshire. So thank you everyone for joining us. And thank you again, Kelly. Welcome, my pleasure. <laughs>